section here. And uh, now, by the way, there, there might be a few people here that do not understand what AGW is. Is there anybody here that doesn't understand what AGW refers to? Yes, Al Gore warming. Uh, but uh, otherwise known as anthropogenic global warming, just like we have the hockey stick with the right, uh, let's see, how do I get back in here? Someone want to help me? Click. Oh, okay, there we go. Now we got Just like we have man-made global warming on your hockey stick, M-A-N-N. -N. Our next speaker, switching from England to the States and from tremendous speaker to a scientist, who's also a good speaker, Dr. Fred Singer, is internationally known for his work on energy and environmental issues. And with uh, Craig Idzo, he's the co-author of The Climate Change, reconsidered the 2009 report of the non-governmental panel, non-governmental international panel on climate change. And I believe there's still some copies of that out there for you to take home and read for the next year. Uh, <laughs> and uh, lots of excellent, excellent, that was a tremendous work to put that together. Uh, in 2007, he co-authored Unstoppable Global Warming every 1,500 years with Dennis Avery, and he is a pioneer in the development of rocket and satellite technology. Uh, you can read the rest of the bio, but also he's the professor emeritus at the, of environmental science at the University of Virginia. He has held positions with the U.S. Department of Transportation, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, U.S. Department of the Interior, University of Miami, uh, the Rasmus Campus, which is right across from uh, where I work in Miami there, National Weather S uh, Satellite Service, and University of Maryland. Uh, he is a research fellow uh, at the Independent Institute and has received numerous awards for his research and frequently testifies before Congress. You can welcome Dr. Fred Singer. Thank you. Pleasure to be able to talk to you uh, about a subject that's made the news recently and I think will continue to make the news for some time to come. I rem remind you first of all of the standard uh, available so-called global temperature curve published by IPCC. I think this particular one is due to uh, GISS. And you'll see here, first of all, the well-known increase between 1920 and 1940, and another increase between 1979 and, let's say, 1998. These two increases are interesting in some respects. Richard Lindzen has, in fact, sent me a a graph that juxtaposes just these two increases and asks people to guess which is which. It's very difficult, they both look the same. I happen to guess right because I figured out the 1998 El Nino event, but they're really very different. What I'd like to show you and suggest to you here is that this increase is genuine it's a real increase in temperature. And this increase here may not be genuine. I won't call it fake. We don't know that. Uh, but it is not quite as represented. How do we know that? Well, uh, you see here, for example, the corresponding curve for the United States. Uh, it doesn't show it shows the 1920 to 1940 increase, and of course the decrease here, but not as large an increase as you see in the global record. That may be because the US record is better controlled and ha has, is better corrected. Still, as McKittrick and Michaels have shown, corrections are necessary because of the urban heat island effect. And as you've just heard from Joe DeLeo, there have been, has been a tremendous uh, abandonment of weather stations, and guess which ones survived? Well, 
the high quality stations at airports. So maybe what we're seeing here is the increase of temperatures at airports around the world rather than a global warming. Anyway, my view on this is based on the fact primarily that the weather satellites don't show this kind of an increase. Uh, they do show an increase, but it's very slight. And I happen to be partial to weather satellites, as you might have guessed. Uh, there's the additional fact that we need to talk about as to the cause of this increase. This one here, the genuine one. Uh, most people, including the IPCC, now accept the fact that this increase is natural, caused by natural forcings, and not by an increase in human-produced greenhouse gases. There's one exception, a paper by Wigley and Santa in Science, which claims that it is human-caused based on some idiosyncratic statistical analysis based on autocorrelations. I have dealt with that separately, but I won't go into any details here, but no one really accepts their work. There are many reasons to doubt the genuineness of this increase. I'll try to give some of them. What I would like to suggest here is that since we don't see any proxy data, or at least I haven't been able to find any proxy data that show this increase, but lots of proxy data that show this increase, this may be the increase that is being hidden in climate gate. We don't know that. Until real experts get onto the climate gate data and do a detailed analysis of just what Jones and company did to the raw data. Until people like uh, Joe D'Aleo and perhaps Anthony Watts get busy and really de deal with this issue, we won't know exactly what they did to manipulate the data. But we can guess or we can suggest that perhaps uh, there, are, since there are uh, no obvious uh, proxy data that show this increase, that maybe much of this increase in the instrument data is fictitious. This is the satellite record, as published by Christie and Spencer. Uh, you will see no discernible trend, at least if you eyeball it. And you will see the very unusual and very strong El Nino warming of 1998, and as you all know, uh, no subsequent warming trend of any consequence in spite of the fact that carbon dioxide levels are increasing rapidly. I won't comment any further on this. So what is this decline that's being hidden? And we know that they're hiding a decline because we have seen it in the email that were released or were leaked from the CRU, from uh, the University of East Anglia. So my view is that the post-1997 warming may be phony. I can't say that it is, but it may be phony. I say this because the proxies that I know of show no warming. So man's trick that is mentioned in the emails may have been to stop his proxy record in 1979 and noting that there was no further increase in proxy data, in warming from proxy data, he then grafted on the Jones CRU instrumental record. When Mann first published his work in 1998, um, many people noticed the fact that there was no medieval warm period and no little ice age. And as you all know, uh, McIntyre and McKittrick did a noble job in showing that man had uh, uh, done, uh, a, shall we say, a poor job of analyzing proxy data. 
Uh, perhaps it was an honest mistake to begin with. We don't know that. We may find out. In any case, what I noticed was the fact that uh, his records suddenly stopped in 1979. Why was that, I asked myself. Why didn't he continue uh, to 1998? So I emailed him, and I have his response. I've carefully saved our email correspondence, and he's emailed to me that there are no suitable records, quote, unquote. I know this to be untrue, because I had some suitable records in my possession. In fact, I had published some of these in a book called Hot Dog Cold Science, published by the Independent Institute. So there are data from Darigo Jacobi. These are uh, tree ring data. Then there are ice core data by Dahl Jensen from uh, Denmark that show no warming subsequent to 1979 from proxy records. I, don't, of course, don't have all the proxy records that are available, but uh, if someone will do the effort, we need proxy data for 1979 to 1987. We need those data. Just to remind you, uh, this is the famous or infamous hockey stick as published by uh, Michael Mann and then republished by the IPCC in 2001, and you'll see that the uh, proxy record suddenly stops in 1979 for no, unex for no explained reason, or for unexplained reasons, and then in red you see the instrumented record. I remember this very well because in the initial publication by the IPCC, uh, which we got as uh, I was a reviewer, uh, they published the proxy record in blue and the Jones record in black. And I objected to that because when you Xerox <laughs> a blue and black her, they're indistinguishable. So they changed the color to red uh, so that if people print it in color, you would see the difference. That was my big contribution to the hockey stick controversy. Uh, here you see the uh, man record in a little more detail, and you see how it suddenly stops in 1979. Uh, the tree-ring record is suspect in any case. Uh, Schwein Gruber has, shows a decrease. Other uh, tree-ring records show an increase. Tree-ring records are notoriously unreliable, and in fact, my colleague uh, Craig Lowley, who may be in the audience here, has published uh, a proxy record of the last 2,000 years based entirely on data that do not include tree rings, and he shows the medieval global warming and the Little Ice Age. So, evidence against post-1979 warming. We have the satellite temperatures that show little trend. We have the tropospheric temperatures that show no warming, hence there must be even less surface warming because we know from theory that the troposphere uh, trends must be larger than the surface trends. Uh, we know that the sea surface temperatures may be an artifact. This has been published by NIPCC. The solar data don't support, support warming. As I just mentioned, the proxy data don't support warming. But the real investigation of the surface data is still outstanding. We need a thorough expert audit of the way in which the station data, the raw data, was selected by Jones and the adjustments that were made to the temperature records. Now, this is my original graph that uh, I'd like to show, which uh, published in 1997, and that's why I was sensitive to Mike Mann's uh, failure to continue past 1979 you see the satellite record shows a negative trend, and the surface record in the tropics shows a positive trend, which is uh, very unlikely and unnatural from a point of view of atmospheric physics. Okay, uh, just to quickly summarize, we've had, of course, climate gate investigations. They're all whitewashes so far. The University of East Anglia 
whitewashed Jones, the Penn State University investigation was very cursory, whitewashed man. The, U the House of Commons of the United, of the Uni United Kingdom uh, uh, was a complete whitewash of both uh, Jones and Mann. And uh, the Royal Society, well, I won't say anything about that. That was a, a kind of a cursory, useless exercise. We still have three more investigations outstanding, but I doubt whether any of these will deal with the, what I think is the real issue, namely, what is the manipulation that was done to the raw data? We now have some realistic investigations. The most important one, I think, is the one by our Attorney General in the state of Virginia. I'm proud of the fact that we helped elect uh, Ken Cuccinelli to be the Attorney General of the Commonwealth of Virginia last November, and he has gotten after the University of Virginia and demanded that they release the emails of Michael Mann, who was a professor at the University of Virginia for a crucial six years from 1999 to 2005, and we will then get the corresponding emails to the ones that were released from the University of East Anglia. We may even find more that were not released. So it's an interesting exercise. Uh, we don't know yet how the university will react to this. They will probably try to fight this, or at least to delay this. They may not succeed, because as you may know, they have agreed to release emails, the email record of, of Pat Michaels to Greenpeace upon the request by Greenpeace. So they really don't have a leg to stand on. However, they may try to do it through the courts or in some political way, it won't do them any good. So we will find out, I think, in due course, whether IPCC's post-1979 warming is real or whether it was man-made. Man-made, quote, unquote. Thank you very much. <laughs>